Hello, and welcome to Central Booking, where writers and readers are the authority. I'm your host, John Valeri. Today, I'm happy to present a virtual visit with Mary Sims. Mary grew up in Darien, Connecticut, and spent much of her childhood writing. Despite her love of fiction, she went on to study journalism in college and later worked in magazine publishing. Then, looking for a new challenge, Mary decided to go to law school and became a successful corporate attorney. But the call of that childhood dream proved too strong to resist, and Mary enrolled in an evening fiction writing class. She then began writing short stories on the side, several of which were published in literary magazines. Ultimately, she heeded the advice of a wise friend and tried her hand at full-length novel writing. That first manuscript eventually became Mary's debut novel, 2013's The Irresistible Blueberry Bake Shop and Cafe. It was later made into a hit Hallmark movie, The Irresistible Blueberry Farm, starring Allison Sweeney, complete with a cameo by the author. The Rules of Love and Grammar followed in 2016. This July, Mary returns with her third novel, The Wedding Thief, the story of two sisters, Sarah and Marielle, who are in love with the same man. Both women are summoned home under false pretenses when their mother tries to force a reconciliation before Marielle walks down the aisle. But Sarah has a few ideas of her own, and sabotage, subterfuge, and all sorts of other surprises soon follow. James Patterson gave the book a rave review, saying, If you're attracted to the title, you'll absolutely love this book. It delivers a great sister-versus-sister story that overflows with warmth and especially humor. Mary Sims is one of our best new storytellers. But you don't have to take his word for it, or mine for that matter. There's just something about Mary, as you're about to see for yourselves. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the show. Today, my guest is Mary Sims, who is the author of The Wedding Thief, which I am going to hold up on my Kindle. I was telling Mary just a couple seconds ago that this is the first time I have flashed a digital book cover at you because I always have a physical book, but not this time. So I'm going to hold it up again just so you can be duly impressed. Um, there's the real thing, not that it isn't. Uh, <laughs> But Mary is the author of The Wedding Thief, which comes out on Tuesday, July 7th, which will probably be very shortly after this video uh, goes up on YouTube. So welcome to the show, Mary. Thanks for being here. Thank you, John. Thanks for having me. It is my pleasure. Um, so I thought we would start by talking a little bit about this book specifically, and then maybe we'll wind back in time a little bit and you can tell us about your writer's journey because you have a really, I think, interesting um, path to publication. And I think a lot of people might, you know, find some inspiration and encouragement in that um, who are thinking, oh, I've wasted time and I can't possibly do something new because you are sort of the proof that you absolutely can. Um, so we are going to work our way there, but for people who aren't familiar, just real quick premise of the book, The Wedding Thief, it's about two sisters who are in love with the same man, um, and one of them happens to be engaged to this man after he was dating the older sister. So, whew, that is heady yeah. time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Whenever I would explain that to people, you know, who would ask me, what are you writing about now? And I tell them that they'd go, ooh. So I knew I was on the right Oh, yeah. Track. What a book. <laughs> it's like I made it a sentence into the pitch and I'm like, yes, I must read this book. I need to know what happens. Um, but so we'll get more specific into the plot, not to spoil anything, but I do want to ask you, so the sister relationship, that dynamic really is the heart of the book. Uh, I don't have sisters, but I've known some sisters, you know, either the best of friends, the worst of enemies, or, you know, sometimes they make that transition and they get from one place to the other. Uh, but what made you decide that you wanted to explore a book where there's sort of a sibling rivalry at the center? Well, uh, it was a couple of things really gave me the idea. And, and I'm an only child, by the way. So I am definitely not an authority. No, I wasn't even going to go there. I was like, this uh, is No, I admit that. I, you know, full, full disclosure, I'm an only child. So that's part of it. I'm intrigued with the whole, you know, sibling relationship thing, especially with sisters, because I've never had any. Um, and, you know, I, when I was growing up, younger kid and then even in high school and and after that I knew a few different you know I had a few different friends who had sister relationships you know sisters and kind of difficult relationships and um, you know and I always thought this is so weird because they're basically from the same DNA and yet these two girls young women whatever are very very different 
And in one case, uh, one was really close to the mother, the other was really close to the father. I kind of use that in my book. Um, but you know, just just a tough time. And I and I I was intrigued by that. I always was intrigued by that. So there was always kind of that I idea rattling around in the back of my head, and just the whole idea of, you know, what is it that makes siblings work? What is it that make them you know, get at each other's throats, you know, who gets the front seat and who chooses the restaurant and, you know, who threw who's Barbie into the pond and that whole thing. Uh, okay. So I just, never having a sister, I guess, is part of it. I find it fascinating. I was going to say, who gets to keep the guy, you know. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who marries the guy? Right. <laughs> um, and I did want to talk to you a little bit more about that. So Sarah is the older sister. Her younger yeah. sister is Marielle. And Marielle basically ends up getting together um, with Sarah's boyfriend. And actually, uh, he is Carter. And he was still dating Sarah at the time. And she basically finds out, you know, at a New Year's, Eve party, she said, oh, there's something going on here and it's not quite right. Um, but I wanted to ask you about the juxtaposition of outward appearances versus sort of internal feelings and emotions, because I think that that's something that's very pronounced, you know, throughout the book and not just in the sisters themselves, but sort of as a whole thematic issue. So can you speak to that momentarily? Or uh, you mean internal narrative versus, yeah, versus what's what's really yeah. happening in the real world. I. I really, it's something that I, I like to do. I, I guess it's that whole idea of having a character who presents as someone who knows, you know, is very competent, knows how to handle themselves, knows what's going on, but inside they're kind of crumbling. And, you know, the world is falling apart, but they're not going to let anybody know. Um, it, it, I think somebody who did that really well in old movies was Katherine Hepburn. You know, she'd come across as this very, I've got, you know, everything together and I know exactly what I'm doing, but she was really a mess. And anybody who watched the movie knew she was a mess. I think that's sort of my favorite kind of character. They want the world to believe they know exactly what they're doing and they have everything under control, but in reality, you know, they just don't. And I, I think that makes kind of a sympathetic person. Sure, sure. Yeah, and I think in your book, it extends, you know, so far beyond the characters. Obviously, they have internal lives and external lives that seem very different, um, but also sort of the entire thing is with appearances versus reality, and somebody thinks this about this person, and that's just not the case. Um, but I did want to ask you, you mentioned briefly the sister's parents before and how one was sort of more aligned with the mother, the other was more aligned in with the father, um, and you know, prior to this book opening, the father actually, um, he is deceased and it sort of yeah. had a different impact on the two sisters. So can you talk a little bit about um, the relationships that they did or didn't have with the father and how that informs uh, the characters that they are or the people? Yeah, Sarah was, uh, Sarah, the older sister, is the one who was very close to the father and Marielle is closer to the mother. Um, the, the parents were both in the theater world the father is a Broadway producer and the mother is um, an actor and, you know, was an actor on Broadway. And, um, and the funny thing is that Sarah is, Sarah is very close to the father and she always feels as though she doesn't really have much in common with her mother and how dramatic the mother is when in reality, you know, there, there's a, there are a lot of common elements there. But Sarah shared with her father a love of things like um, music, uh, old jazz standards, you know, by the Gershwins and Cole Porter and Jerome Kern. And, you know, he loved to listen to Frank Sinatra and Ella Fitzgerald and all that kind of music. And Sarah grew up with that. And she, they just, you know, she gravitated toward him. And, and they were very, very close. She still talks about his collection of music that's there in the house and how he was the one who got her interested in that. And, um, you know, it's not that she doesn't get along with her mother, but they don't have that sort of special bond that Sarah had with her father. And on the other hand, um, Marielle and the mother, you know, seem to click. The mother, uh, Camilla, will kind of make excuses for Marielle and let her get away with certain things. And, uh, you know, she just, um, she's her mama's girl. So, so that's sort of the dynamic. 
Sure, and um, so the mother, I have to say a lot of people comment um, on how much they love your quirky characters. Uh, and mom definitely is a character. I mean, it's- She's my favorite. Oh, she's great. It's entirely fitting that she's an actress. Um, <laughs> But I should say, you know, the whole book sort of starts with a phone call where she says to Sarah, basically she leads Sarah to believe that she is on her deathbed, um, you know, and you must come home. So Sarah rushes home from Chicago and Marielle rushes home from Los Angeles. And this is about two weeks before the wedding um, that Sarah is not planning on attending, um, only to find that mom is perfectly healthy and she's, you know, standing up cooking in the kitchen when Sarah walks through the door. And it's really, it's her heartbreak, you know, over this um, fractured relationship between her daughters. Uh, and so mom is this really, really great character, but, you know, she has very good intentions. And unfortunately, some of the consequences of, you know, her actions or the way that she has um, been involved with her daughters throughout the years have have consequences that weren't necessarily uh, what she intended. So can you talk a little bit about um, her character and her dynamic with her two daughters? Yeah, I you know, she, the mom is an interesting character, I think, because she thinks that, um, that Sarah kind of, again, you know, Sarah presents in one way, and, and the mom thinks Sarah doesn't need any help, and Sarah's, you know, very competent and can do things on her own and, and, and sees Marielle as this, the daughter who, you know, really needs the mom in her life and can't do anything. And she, she's got, and I think, you know, parents have a tendency to do this, unfortunately. They, they pigeonhole, sometimes they pigeonhole their kids into different roles. So Sarah's kind of the very the smart one, the competent one. Oh, Sarah, you're so good at this. Help your sister, you know, help her. Help the last couple of weeks before the wedding, she's been planning this herself and she's going crazy. And you, this is your profession. You're great at this. You've got to help her. And Sarah's thinking, why am I going to want to help my sister marry the guy who I'm still in love with, who she stole from me? But that's, that's the mom. Sarah, you're competent. Your sister isn't. Um, but, you know, and then on the Marielle side, it's, she needs help, she needs my help, she needs your help, you know, um, we have to, you know, we have to do what we can to help her because she's kind of a lost soul, she hasn't figured herself out yet, and, you know, we come to find out Marielle isn't as much of a lost soul as the mother thinks she is. So there's definitely some, some pigeonholing going on, the mom having a little bit of blinders on, and also, you know, just tending to think, oh, you girls can work this out. You know, she, not, re I mean, not really making light of it, but kind of making light of it. Like, come on, she's getting married in two weeks. You know, you've got to work this out. I don't want my girls fighting. Like, you go off and, you know, figure it out. You know, right. come back when you figured it out, that kind of thing. Like, wait, it's not that easy. Sure. And one of the things I love about the book, too, is, uh, you know, it's just these, families and complexities and misunderstandings. And I think, you know, any of us with families can really relate to that because a lot of times, you know, you think, oh, it's just us, you know, who could experience something like this? And then you read about it and you realize you're really not so alone in the world because there's always some type of friction or misunderstanding in a family, even if it's this kind. Um, but anyway, I will move away from that point. But before we talk a little bit more about the wedding antics, um, I just want to ask you about Carter. So Carter is the boyfriend. You know, Sarah thought maybe he was the love of her life, and it turns out that quite possibly he's actually the love of uh, Marielle's life. Uh, but he represents, you know, very different things to the two sisters. So can you talk a little bit about what he embodies um, to each of them, what they see in him is his attractive or maybe not so attractive qualities? Yeah, Sarah sees in Carter this guy who is, you know, very smart, very talented, can really solve any kind of problem, and, and which is, you know, the way she looks at herself as well. She's, you know, her attitude about herself is, I can deal with whatever you throw at me. I'm good. You know, I can think on my feet. I can solve things. And so she's attracted to Carter. He's an entertainment lawyer in Los Angeles. He's very successful. But he also is the kind of guy who, and I think this is one of the things she thinks about in the book, if you were traveling to Paris or Rome, he, he would know somebody there and he'd, he'd 
give you their number and work it out so you could meet with them and they'd take you to dinner or show you the city. If your child needed to go to a special school, Carter would be the one who would, he would know the headmaster. You know, he's just very wired in, but not only that, he's very generous and gracious about sharing that kind of information and doing that kind of thing for people. So he was like the go-to guy. And Sarah really admired that about him. Mary L admires the fact that he's got a lot of celebrity clients. You know, she's into that whole thing. Oh, he's got Hollywood A-listers as clients. And he makes a lot of money. And so she wants somebody who's going to give her that kind of financial stability and also that excitement because, you know, she's a beauty queen. She got the good looking DNA gene in the family. And here's a nice guy who she figures she'd look good on his arm and he looked good on her arm. And you know, I'm not saying she doesn't love him, but she just, you know, as you point out, there are, there are qualities in him that, she picks out and sees specifically versus the qualities that Sarah does. And, and those are the kinds of things Marielle is kind of keyed into. Sure. sure. All right, so I have to ask you. So, you know, the two sisters, they're drawn home under false pretenses two weeks before the wedding. Um, and Sarah wants absolutely nothing to do with it. Um, and then she gets hit with the fact that not only does her sister need a fill-in bridesmaid, um, but it would really help to have a wedding planner too. And of course, Sarah is an events planner in her professional life. Um, and initially, you know, she says like, absolutely not. That's ludicrous. Why would I want anything to do with this wedding or you or Carter? I'm not sticking around for it. And then she thinks, well, wait a minute, this is sort of the perf perfect opportunity for me to get my revenge because if I'm your wedding planner, I can basically sabotage your wedding. Um, and so she sort of schemes all of these fantastical ways uh, to basically ruin uh, her sister's big day. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, where those ideas, what those ideas are and where they came from? Because they're very devious and I kind of love it. <laughs> Well, yeah, I, I actually, um, we have a, a family friend who is an event planner and I picked her brain a lot because I, I wouldn't have thought of these things, but I, you know, I would be on the phone with her and I'd say, so if you wanted to ruin a wedding, um, what are the things you do? And she came up with this list and it just, you know, it kind of evolved, you know, it's basically take all the elements of a wedding and think about how they need to go. And then you just unravel them one by one. Like the music playlist, you know, you put some songs on there that like Divorce by Tammy Wynette or, you know, a few of these other tunes that, you know, nobody's gonna want to hear at a wedding. Um, you know, you mess around with the seating arrangements. So you've got, um, you know, the, the cousin who punched the other cousin the last time there was a, a a family gathering five years ago away because they were, you know, they were drunk and having some spat. You, you sit, seat them together. Um, you change the menu. You, um, uh, I'm trying to think what else I did. Oh, she thought there were a few things she thought about doing too, um, but didn't quite get around to it. Um, directing, giving people directions to the wrong church. That would be one thing as well. Um, you know, pretty much anything that's supposed to, uh, changing the music for the ceremony, uh, putting something in the um, program for the ceremony that's wrong. Oh, she was going to fool around with the wedding vows as well. She was going to change the wedding vows. So, you know, um, yeah, they were pretty, pretty devious, but, you know, she was having fun and I was having fun writing it. I can tell you that. Oh yeah. I was thinking this would make a great movie. I was also thinking, does she have a sister? <laughs> but now I know that you don't, so I feel so much better about things. Um, but I have to say, I think the one thing I loved, and I don't think this is spoiling anything, but um, so Mariel had a sort of very famous opera singer who was going to perform <laughs> at the wedding, and so the sister goes behind her back and wants to change the song selection, and she asks her if she would do Britney Spears' Baby One More Time. Yeah. Uh, Mariel as a teenager went through a Britney Spears phase and I thought that was hysterical. <laughs> I can't get over that. <laughs> uh, so yeah, you know. That would be a good movie scene. I really think so. Yeah, that, that would probably be a good, really good scene. It totally would. <laughs>
Hollywood should come calling. Um, <laughs> but all right, so to move on a little bit, so Sarah, you know, has her own transformation throughout the novel, and she actually, she finds herself on a collision course, I guess actually it's a literal collision course, uh, with yeah. a guy named David, and he has sort of a very different sibling experience, and so a different perspective on life and what that relationship could or should be. Um, so can you talk a little bit about that and how it sort of changes how uh, Sarah ends up you know, looking at herself and her actions? Yeah, David had a brother, um, an older brother, who um, drowned, hit his head doing a dive, uh, you know, off of a cliff into a lake and, um, and drowned when they were kids. And he mentions that to Sarah in a, a car ride that they're taking when she's you know, uh, complaining about her sister or, you know, talking about the upcoming wedding or whatever. And, um, you know, he, he, talk, he just, he talks about how much he misses his brother and that they were very close. And, you know, he, he wishes that he had him there and he, and he doesn't. And um, yeah, that's one of the things that, that I thought was, something like that I thought was important for Sarah to hear. So, you know, to kind of compare the experiences. His attitude is kind of like, you don't know what you've got. You need to figure out a way to fix this. And um, yeah, and, and of course, you know, she's, she's got blinders on for so much of the story. Sure. And, you know, obviously very much of the book is dramatic and there's, you know, a lot of high tension um, and emotion, but there's also a lot of comic relief. Uh, for instance, you know, she and David, it seems like this out of nowhere plot where they get confused with the uh, the bake shop bandits or the baked good bandits and, you know, right. think that they're stealing pies and cakes and cookies um, from counties, you know, all around, <laughs> all around this town. Um, but can you talk a little bit about what that adds to the story and also how you go about, um, you know, developing some humor to offset the more serious undertones of a book? Yeah, you know, I, I actually think most of my plot points start with humor and then the serious stuff kind of folds in there. I mean, I don't start out writing humorous books, but it just, it happens. The, the things that I find are kind of funny just find their way in there. And I'm glad they do because I think humor is important, especially these days, you know, you need to be able to laugh and you need to have something light. And it's kind of like, you know, in a movie, even in a, like a horror movie or a thriller where you're watching these people, you know, run and try to get away from something horrible and all this bad stuff is happening. And then there's this little bit of comic relief and everybody in the movie theater just, you know, relaxes for a minute and kind of settles down so that they can then go on with this horrible story wow. that, you know, so, and my books aren't like that because they're not horror stories, but I do think... I like to use the humor, yes, as a way to offset um, some of the drama. And I, you know, I don't know how it comes up. I just don't. But very early in, the, in that book, Sarah does something. She does something to damage a sculpture. And right, and right off the bat, you know, we're often running on a, on a side plot that is kind of silly. And yeah, they do get in trouble later because they're mistaken for some people who are who are stealing baked goods throughout the county, and um, and that ends up having a disastrous effect, but in, but in a funny way. So yeah, I just I I try to balance it out, and it's not really anything that I do um, consciously. It's just I, here's the bottom line: I'm a sucker for a romantic comedy movie or a dramedy. So I think I write the kind of thing I I like to see. Sure. Um, you know, I just, and the humor is just part of it. Sure. And I have to say, it works really well because humor is one of those things, you know, I mean, it works or it doesn't, and you know. Yeah. <laughs> and fortunately, it always, it works in your books. So kudos to you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm yeah. glad. Of course. Um, and I wanted to ask you a little bit about the setting as well, because your books, you know, tend to take place in Connecticut, though a lot of times it's a fictionalized um, version of Connecticut. But obviously, yeah. you know, your roots are here uh, and you still visit frequently. So can, can you talk about how you're able to draw on your own experiences um, of place to, to sort of enliven your stories? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, my, my, these 
first three books all took place in fictional towns in Connecticut. In, in fact, um, well, The Wedding Thief is kind of modeled after Litchfield County, the towns up there. Uh, the first two books took place in fictional towns that were more like um, maybe uh, Old Saybrook-y, you know, on the coast above New Haven. Although I used elements of, well, the first book's in Maine, so I, I have to correct that, sorry. First book takes place in Maine, the second in Connecticut, the third in Connecticut. So um, the second book, uh, The Rules of Love and Grammar, takes place in a town called Dorset, which is which is kind of an amalgam of a little bit of Darien, a little bit of New Canaan, a little bit of the towns above New Haven, like Old Saybrook and, and that area. And then The Wedding Thief takes place in the fictional town of Hampstead, but that's really based on Litchfield County. So I, I mean, I grew up in Darien. I lived in Connecticut, you know, really most of my life. And it's, it's yeah, it's where my roots are. And I just find it so, I find it really picturesque. You know, it's, it, New England to me is just a beautiful area and I love to write about it. It just, it's just one of those things that when I sit down to write, that's what comes to mind. Sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. And um, your books are, you know, very descriptive. And I'm going to ask you about that in a second, because I know that you're interested in photography and you've done a lot of yeah. that throughout the years. Um, but I did want to say too, for people, you know, who sort of have that appreciation uh, for visuals, if they check out your social media, it's really cool. You can actually, you know, see pictures um, of places that inspire, you know, places in this actual book. So you can see an inn that inspired the hotel. You can see a house that inspired this um, sort of grand estate. So I would definitely encourage people who sort of like to have that mental image already in place. They should probably check you out on Facebook and Instagram and all of that. Um, Thank you. Yeah. But I think if you don't do that, you still, you get a very clear visual. And so I did want to ask you about your interest uh, in photography and whether or not you find uh, that that influences how you're able to visualize people and places in your story and then sort of render that on the page. Yeah, I, I think it has a big impact. I don't know if the fact that I've taken thousands and thousands of pictures over my life helps me be a better writer or if I just am a visual person. And so when I write and when I photograph, I, you know, I'm able to kind of home in on that. I don't know, but I've taken pictures ever since I was a kid with one camera or another, starting with, you know, some little Kodak and then working my way up through the various Nikons that I've had over the years. And when I sit down to write, I do it in a very visual way. I picture the scene, I can see the foreground, the background, I know who is in the scene. I sort of sit there and I just look off into space and I think about where the characters are. Sometimes I feel like I'm a frustrated movie director and I tell people that. Because, you know, here I am sort of moving these people around in my own imaginary stage. But that's, that is how it works. And you mentioned the, um, the photos. I have something that, I have a lot of photos on my laptop of, you know, that I collected in doing research in different areas. So that I have places to start when I was describing something. And I also have, um, I took a bunch of them and created an idea board which is going to be, um, I'll be putting that on my, uh, on my social media um, pages as well. But it, it kind of, it shows a lot of those photos, um, different places. There's even a picture of um, Marielle's wedding gown uh, on there. So yeah, I, I do use photos. I use photos a lot as starting points, um, jumping off points, like the house that, Sarah goes back to the, the house where she grew up as a child, where her mother still lives. The, the inside of it, I didn't use except for one room. Um, but the outside and the grounds, I, you know, I pretty much stuck with. Um, so yeah, that was, that was a good inspiration. And um, yeah, I, it's, I'm very, very visual that way. Yes. 
Sure. And I wanted to ask you too, it seems um, to me like some of the things that I've read about you, you know, indicate that you bring a lot of your own, you know, hobbies or interests into your books in one fashion or another. You know, obviously we talked about the photography, uh, you know, jazz music. I'm not sure yeah. if you're a fan of baked goods, but you know, there, there's a lot of that in the food in the book. a little bit of that. Who doesn't? I was going to say, who doesn't like that? I mean, we probably wouldn't be talking if uh, you had something <laughs> But can you talk a little bit about the things that, how you use the things that interest you personally and you're able to incorporate those into the book? Because I think that they bring a really, you know, fun and engaging dynamic because you can always tell, you know, when somebody has that sort of firsthand experience, it just, it translates better, I think. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree with you. I think the big things are probably the photography and the music. I mean, in my first novel, um, The Irresistible Blueberry Bake Shop and Cafe, the main character, Ellen, is well there are three things that she got from me she's a lawyer i'm a lawyer uh she loves photography and she loves old jazz standards um so you know that those were three things that were very very much like me uh in the second novel the rules of love and grammar the main character grace is a writer she's doing sort of business type writing at the time but she can really do more creative writing than that she's got a different kind of talent but she hasn't gotten to the point where she thinks there's an she's not confident enough in herself so and she and she thinks she needs to go in this practical route of you know business writing that's how she'll support herself but um so but she's a writer she's definitely you know and i'm a writer so and then in this last book again we come back to the to the music I have, a, I, you know, I love putting that kind of stuff in because it lets me go and research and find out things about songs that maybe I didn't know. Um, and I've, you know, I've got old, I've got jazz music going back years and years and years to, you know, LPs stored in Connecticut in our, in our house up there. Um, and so I've loved that stuff for a long time. So I love putting that in there. In fact, the funny thing was that my copy editor for this book also loves that the great american songbook it's called all those you know the the great jazz standards uh and broadway stuff too which i do as well so she just she would make you know comments when she was copy editing the book about oh i love him as well and i love this song and you know um so it was it was really fun but yeah it's it just it just comes out it's my love of it and if i can weave that into a story somehow i'm gonna do it yeah, no, that's great. I feel similar just about the fact that I read a lot and I can, if I get caught in bed in the middle of the day with my, with a book, I can tell my wife legitimately that I'm working. I mean, <laughs> a little bit different, but you know, same other tones there. Yeah, um, you've got a good excuse. You know, right? That's what I, that's what I say. Uh, sometimes she believes it. Um, <laughs> so I did want to sort of work our way back uh, too, because I alluded to this at the beginning, but you have a really, you know, sort of interesting path um, to publication in the fiction because you actually, if I understand correctly, you know, you wrote short stories as a child um, and then you actually worked uh, in journalism um, and then decided that you wanted to uh, learn law. Well. Yeah. Um, and you did that and then you decided that you sort of wanted to come back to writing. So can you talk about um, one, you know, your background in journalism and then after your career as a lawyer, what sort of brought you back uh, to writing? Yeah, yeah. Well, I was working, I got out of school and I was working for a trade magazine that was headquartered in New Canaan, Connecticut at the time. This is many years ago. It was called Folio, the magazine for magazine management. I think it might still be online, but at the time it was as all magazines were back then, you know, an actual physical right. tangible thing with a slick cover and it covered the world of magazine publishing. And so as far as trade magazines went, it was very interesting, um, you know, as opposed to maybe working for, you know, uh, Pencils Weekly or Tire Tread Monthly or something like that. Here was a magazine about magazine publishing. So I, I did that for a couple of years. And then, you know, I kind of thought about, well, what's my trajectory going to be? If I want to stay in magazine publishing, I really need to go to New York because that's where everything's happening. And I couldn't quite get my arms around commuting into the city from Connecticut, paying triple taxes, um, probably not making much money uh, to boot, you know, all that stuff added together. 
And I had friends who were lawyers. I always thought it was interesting. And, um, and there you go. So I went, decided to apply to law school. I went to law school and then got out of law school, worked for a firm in Greenwich for a couple of years, decided I wanted to do the corporate route because I thought maybe it was a little more sane, um, which it's not. Uh, somebody I met along the way likened it to working in a legal mash unit. And I thought, oh, that's a, that's a great description. You know, you have one client, it's this company, but you have hundreds of people within the company. So um, it was just as crazy, but it was a great job. I was there for 15 years and I loved it. But along the way, after I was maybe there for six or seven years, I got to the point where I really missed creative writing. I had, as you said, done it as a kid. I used to write these little stories and sometimes I'd, you know, illustrate them with my crayons or my pens or whatever and wrote through high school and, you know, on up. And then I had kind of put it away and I really, really missed it. And I was, I kept thinking, I need to get back into writing. You know, I'd be driving along and I'd be thinking about dialogue or characters or making up stories in my head. and and then I just got to the point where I said, either I'm going to get into a car accident because I'm not paying attention enough, or I have to find some way to get, you know, deal with this, this, you know, desire to get back into doing something more creative. And I, I happened to find out about a class that was being taught at Fairfield University at night, one night a week. And it was a fiction class taught by this author named Jamie Cat Callen and who has written a number of books. And I went, I signed up for it and I went and I was hooked after the first night. It was just, she's a great teacher. It was a great class. It, you know, it was a lot of students who were college age, but then you had a group of people like me. We had been out in the workaday world for a few years and they are, you know, people um, doing all sorts of careers. And it was, a, it was just a great group. It was a great group. And that got me started writing short stories. Jamie was very encouraging and it was fun. And we shared our work and, you know, all the, all the stuff that is great for writers because it's such a lonely business. Right. But when you're in a class and you, you know, people give you feedback and you hear the great stuff other people are writing, you know, it just would give me goosebumps. It just, it gives me goosebumps now to think about it. There was so much talent. That's what got me back into it. That's what did it. And um, I said to myself, double negative, but I said, I'm never not going to be writing. And sure. that was it. Oh, that's great. And I think really, you know, that's all it takes is a couple of like-minded people and they really are out there. You just have to be, you know, lucky enough to find them. Um, yeah. So then, you know, you started back with short stories and you ultimately uh, made the transition to full length novels. So can you talk a little bit about what inspired you to do that and, you know, what you find to be sort of the joys and the challenges of each? Um, because they are similar, but they are also quite different. <laughs> Very different. Yeah. Yeah. I, I worked, I did a lot of short story writing and I got some of them published. And, um, you know, and, and that was, that was going well, but Jamie kept saying, you need to write a novel. And then there was also kind of a break there because I did a lot of this when I was still living in Connecticut. And then my husband and I moved down to Florida. I had a daughter, some, a few years went by and I wasn't doing any writing at all. And then I decided, you know, I need to get, again, I need to get back into it. So I was working on more stories and sending them out and nothing was getting published. And, and Jamie, who, you know, we became friends since I took that course and we're very good friends now, but she kept saying, you, you know, you need to write a novel. And I kept thinking I could never write a novel. I don't think I could take an idea and go for more than about 30 pages. Um, and it just didn't, it just didn't seem like something I could do because bringing up the issue that they're different with a short story in 20 or 30 pages, you've got a beginning, a middle and an end, it, you know, which is, that's the good news and the bad news. Right. It's, it's, you know, you don't have to go longer than that, but you got to get it all in there somehow. And, uh, and, and it was easier to do that kind of stuff, staying up till one and two in the morning and then going to work than thinking about a whole novel. And 
but she said, you know, it's hard. It's hard to sell short stories. You've got to write a novel. I know you have it in you. And she said, just, you know, she never really pressured me too much. She, she would always say very gently, just keep it in the back of your mind. Just think about, you know, just, just let it sit there a little bit. So one morning I was getting ready to go to our law firm to work. We came down to Florida and we started our own law firm. And I heard this thing on the radio and it was this woman talking about how her grandmother had died. And right before she died, she said, erase my hard drive. And I thought, what in the world is on this woman's hard drive? Was she, a, you know, a spy? Did she have some secret life? Did she have a child nobody knew about? You know, what was and that got me thinking about secrets and family secrets. And that got me into the first novel. And that's what it was. And after I had written 75 pages, I said, I can tell people now that I'm writing a novel because mm -hmm. I'm this far into it. And now if I say it, I know I'm going to finish it. So I won't be humiliated. Sure. So. And actually to follow up on that, um, so your first book, The Irresistible Lurie Bake Shop and Cafe, it was actually uh, made into a Hallmark movie with a slightly different name. I think it was The Irresistible Blueberry Farm. Um, exactly, yeah. Like that. But I have to ask you because, you know, a lot of people think that you write a book and of course, you know, somebody's going to option it and make it into a film and that hardly ever happens. I mean, mm -hmm. options aren't entirely rare, but actually making it onto a screen, whether big or small, that is a huge yeah. accomplishment. So I have to yeah. ask one, um, you know, did you have any involvement or say in that process? But also, what was it like to see somebody else bring your vision or their version of your vision to life? Uh, that first question, I didn't. I, um, it was Allison Sweeney, who uh, was one of the executive producers. It was really her project. She read the book. She really wanted to do it, and she wanted to do it for Hallmark. She had worked with Hallmark before, producing and acting, and she had it all, you know, it was her vision, and there were three other executive producers as well, but it was her idea. So we, you know, we talked about it, and she said, do you want to give, take a stab at writing the screenplay? And I, I said no, because I was really way into the guts of my second book at that point. And I just thought, you know, I had a deadline on that. I, can't, I couldn't imagine how I could make it work. If I ever had the opportunity again, I'd do it. Right. But that said, hey, you know, that's hindsight is twenty twenty. It is what it is. And I like the screenplay that, that they did. So I didn't, um, I didn't you know, have a say in it. I didn't work on the screenplay. But um, the second question about what was it like, it was amazing. I spent two days on the set between two trips that we had a family trip to Italy and then we were taking our daughter to college. And squeezed in between there, I had four days. It was, I'm telling you, I could have stayed on that set for a week or two yeah. or three. It was so much fun, but I managed to fly out and spend two days in these little towns around Vancouver, British Columbia, which is where they filmed it. Uh, these towns were like a stand-in for, for Maine. And um, it was surreal in a really, really good way. And everybody was so nice to me and everybody was so interested in my reaction you know how does it feel to be here and see your work come to life and see you know shirley jones be the grandmother and allison you know be you know the part of ellen and i it was it was amazing i i told people i you know it's hard to believe it really really was and it was just one of the highlights of my life it and now i know how playwrights feel because they go through this all the time. Um, but not being a playwright, never having been through it, it was, it was magical. It really, really was. It was magical. Yeah, that's great. And it's nice to know that it was, you know, such a positive experience because, yeah. you know, sometimes you hear that it's just a horror story for authors. What did they do to my book? You know, they have such a hard time, you know, letting go and accepting the fact that, yes, it is going to be, you know, somebody else's vision. You know, I yeah. think Cash the paycheck and be happy. You made it to the screen. Um, it's a, and as you say, it's a it's a vision. You know, a book is a book, a movie is a movie. They're never right. going to be the same thing. They're never going to be the same. But I was happy, and I had a little cameo in it too. I'm gonna have to go look you up. That's awesome.
that's like the dream come true. But also just the fact that you could let yourself enjoy it and, you know, acknowledge, okay, yes, it's based on my work, but somebody else has a vision. Because I really think, you know, so many things in life are about perspective. And if you can yeah. get your mindset right, it's going to be, you know, so much more a positive experience. Uh, but if you don't mind, two more quickish questions for yeah. me. So I do want to ask you, and I think you, you know, touched a little bit on this when you were sharing your own journey to publication, but there are so many people, you know, out in the world who are aspiring to write um, or to do something else creatively, and they just don't really have the confidence or maybe the time um, to pursue sort of those artistic passions. So what advice, you know, would you give to people who are just struggling to actually make the commitment to sit down and try to do something? Well, what I did, and I think the best advice is keep your day job, but do it on the side. You know, do it on the side until you can get to a point where the side becomes the main course, basically. Um, and start small. I mean, with, with writing, I, I always tell people, start with short stories. It's just easier to manage. I mean, a novel, as you know, is basically, you know, one short story after another, one chapter after another, each one being its own little short story. But I could never have started, uh, you know, writing if I if I thought I, I needed to write a whole novel. I think starting small is really the best way. And, you know, talking to anybody you know who is in that field, I think people want to help if they can. And, um, you know, whether it's writing or, I don't know, making jewelry or, or doing anything creative, seek out the people you know who are in the field, you know, get their advice. People are usually you know, as I say, uh, you know, really helpful. And just, and do it on the side. I mean, I used to stay up till literally one and two in the morning. I was a lot younger then, <laughs> but, but I did it. And then I'd go to work, you know, as a corporate lawyer the next day. And, um, but, you know, but don't give up on your dreams. I mean, I never, ever, ever would have thought coming out of college that I would end up being an author. I just, that's something, you know, those people do. I can't do that. Uh, so I, I did have a very, very circuitous route uh, in, in getting where I am. And, and, that, and that's fine. The other thing that's good is if you're out there in the world doing whatever you're doing, you're going to use that. You know, that is going to come through in your work, whatever that creative work might be. It's never wasted. Whatever you're doing now is just giving you, is filling you out as a person is giving you the, you know, the dimension and the layers and all the other things that are going to make that work even more worthwhile when you do it. So, you know, take what you have and, and, and be happy for all that background that you've got, no matter what it's in. Sure, I was going to say, and it's quite evident in your books that you're able to draw on those experiences and it gives them a really nice realism. Um, and you can tell, like, yes, she's done this, she's been through this, she's had that experience. And I think that that always helps because even when you're writing fiction, you know, there is some expectation of realism unless it's, you know, otherworldly fiction. Um, and my final question to you, and I have to ask, and I don't know if you like this question or if it'll drive you crazy because, you know, I know that books take a very long time to write. You know, it is a process. It does not happen quickly, as some people like to think, and you are finally ushering the wedding thief out into the world. But uh, do you have any thoughts on what you might be working on next? Is there anything that you can tease for people who are already, you know, jonesing for the next one? I am working on something. I'm probably about 70 pages into another book, and it doesn't take place in Connecticut. That's all I will tell you. Wow, that's very mysterious. <laughs> it has a woman protagonist again, and it's, again, going to be a combination of, you know, drama and humor. So hopefully there'll be something for everyone. Oh, that's excellent. And of course, I have to hold up the cover one more time. So the yeah. book is The Wedding Thief, which will be out on July 7th. Thank you so much for your time, Mary. It was really delightful to finally talk to you in some kind of real time. Thank you, John. It was my pleasure. Oh, thank you so much. And I do have to say, um, you know, living in uncertain times, this is sort of the best type of escapism. I read it in like two sit downs over the weekend. And it really sort of took me out of the world that we're all living in right now and transported me to a place um, where, you know, I can put my own concerns aside because there are plenty of other people have their own concerns. Um, and it was a, a terrific distraction. So I think that if people are looking for that, uh, they're really, really going to enjoy this read. So thank you for, thank you for that. It's really a gift. Well, that's the best compliment I could get. So, so thank you. I appreciate it. That's it for this episode of Central Booking. Thanks for watching. And be sure to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss a thing.